I'm Brittany Abshore, and this is the Proof of Plant-Based Living. It's the story of how food can change our lives, the power of nutrition. With the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies and Armstrong Neighborhood Channel, we'll unravel the complex mystery of why health eludes some and embraces others. Americans need to know the truth. Through expert interviews, we'll uncover the research explaining why we're unnecessarily sick, why we're dying early despite trillions spent in healthcare, and why a system that's supposed to help us often hurts us. And we'll share stories of hope, those who took back their health simply by changing their diet, reversing heart disease, diabetes, and even cancer. The evidence is clear. The key to a long, healthy life is in breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Welcome everybody to episode two of the Proof of Plant-Based Living. This is a collaboration between the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies and Armstrong Cable. Now in our last episode, you heard from nutrition researcher T. Colin Campbell and his son, Dr. Tom Campbell. They're the authors of the China study. And they were discussing how cancer can be prevented, halted, and even reversed by using a plant-based diet. And today we're actually hearing from a woman who did just that. In 2008, Allison Murphy was diagnosed with glioblastoma. That is an aggressive form of cancer that affects your brain and your spinal cord. The survival rate for this form of cancer is extremely low. In fact, only about 5% survive to five years past diagnosis. But as you will see, Allison is still here. Her tumors are pretty much gone, and she hardly even thinks about cancer these days, actually. Allison, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your story with us. You are now a health coach, a yoga practitioner, and a school teacher in New York, so you do it all. You look great. Um, so tell me first, let's Let's go back to 2008 and tell me about your diagnosis in the doctor's office that day. It was actually in a matter of two days, you found two tumors. Right. And I had not gone to him for any kind of brain issue. He had happened to do some spine surgery for me and being a neurosurgeon, he was following up. Everything went along fine. And he said that he found something and he described my dad's tumor and I just started sobbing and, uh, he said, this has to come out. And I immediately said, no, that was just uh, an intuitive response. And mm -hmm. so I left his office feeling uh, scared at that time and stunned, I would say, um, because I had just gotten a um, clean bill of health. I had an eighth grader at the time. And mm -hmm. I had to sit out in my car and gather myself to make sure I'd be able to drive home okay. In fact, I picked my daughter up and I passed the school bus while it was stopped. And so it was a hard, that was just, you know, the first couple of hours. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think that shock that you're describing, that sitting in your car and wondering what you're going to even tell your eighth grade daughter um, about this diagnosis. That's something that a lot of people fear in their lives. That's not something that you want to hear, especially when you're not going to the doctor expecting that kind of news. So, you know, right. I think a lot of people can relate to that just shock. Um, when did it start to hit you? And, and you mentioned your, your dad as well. And that's how you, you really, I think, knew to put this together that this was sort of a scary diagnosis because it was an identical tumor that your dad had passed away from. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how many years previously. Yeah, my dad passed away six months after his diagnosis. He had a seizure in the car and six months later he was gone. My mother was already diagnosed with ovarian cancer and living, struggling at the same time with that diagnosis. So um, luckily, I work in a school district. I've been there now 33 years. I work in a school district that's got strong resources. I was able to get into Sloan Kettering the very next day. And um, they said, well, you not only have this very tiny, delicate tumor beginning, you also have a tumor on your pineal gland. And um, so something very deep inside me when said, 
when I heard validation from Sloan, they said to me regarding the right frontal lobe glioblastoma, they said to me, we're not going to touch this. Let's just keep our eyes on it. So that I got validation that way. And mm -hmm. something very, very deep inside me said, there's no way that I'm dying from this tumor. I just knew this very deeply that I wouldn't have any trouble with it. I had no symptoms. You know, it was found on accident. So um, something just came through me and I was not afraid. Mm-hmm. Which is interesting, especially considering the fact that your da dad had died within six months of diagnosis. So for you to be able to say, that's not going to be me, what played into that? I come from a family. My parents were like um, unschooled health experts. I, I grew up knowing that I had a relationship in, within my physical body with my emotional body. My mother told me at a very young age, whenever you're physically ill, make sure you're also looking at what's going on with you emotionally. Um, and so I grew up with parents who grew their own food, who were well ahead of the organic game and the supplement game. Um, the irony, however, was that they did wind up with cancer mm -hmm. because well, I, I, I can't say why for sure, but I did grow up in a family with lots of meat and potatoes, which I never liked. I never liked meat. Um, but, the, but the knowledge was there somehow of honoring your physical body mm -hmm. through food, even though they were eating meat. And I knew once I was out of the house, like I did everything my parents told me to do, which included eating meat and drinking milk, with them, which was gross to me. Um, and I knew once I got out of the house, I wasn't going to pay attention to a lot of those rules anymore. So I had that embedded in me from a very young age. Physical wellness was huge in my family. Exercise, whole foods, gardening, you know, uh, a lot of sleep. So I was mm -hmm. groomed to be a health coach from, I guess, you know, when I was a little yeah. girl. Yeah, all the pillars of health are, are so important. And you also, you know, you were lucky going into this diagnosis. I think that you had um, the knowledge of the China study. You had already read that book by T. Colin Campbell. Um, and so you went back to that, correct? What happened then? I did. I did. In fact, I got a grant from my school program, Plant Nutrition for Cancer. So I did an experiment on myself. And... I was able to not completely eliminate any animal products for a long, long period of time. I went in and out of being completely plant-based to just having a little bit, like he says, have a little bit, 20% of your plate can be like a condiment of, of meat. So I would go in and out of that. and. Uh, I think one of my very first visits, one of my very first scans after I got the diagnosis, very quickly I remember, I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact time frame after the diagnosis, but it wasn't too long and my doctor said, it's actually shrinking, you know, keep doing what you're doing. And I explained what I was doing. And although he listened to me graciously, uh, he, he um, said, just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah, one of the parts of your story that I really like, um, you wrote to the Center for Nutrition Studies a few years ago, and you had said um, you had been, you know, following this plant based diet. Then you met someone who sort of um, followed the standard American diet. You allowed a little bit of, or a little bit more than you were allowing of some meat and animal, other animal protein products back in your diet. And you almost predicted that during your next scan, when you went to the doctor, that that tumor that you had was not going to shrink any more than what you saw it shrinking previously. So I think that that's really interesting because that's a lot of where um, T. Colin Campbell's research was, was showing that they could increase this amount of, or the size of tumors based on how much animal protein um, is given. So tell me about that, and because it's so interesting. 
so I started dating a man who ate meat regularly and mm -hmm. um, I started eating some along with him and I had a feeling that my next scan would show that there wasn't any movement and I'm quite intuitive. Um, and, and now at, at the stage in my life, I'm, a, I'm better able to honor my intuition. Back then um, it was a guess and I didn't necessarily take it so seriously like I do today looking back, but I did take a guess that I would not have any movement and that was the case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you got diagnosed with these two tumors. You start the plant-based diet. Um, you go to the doctor and they say your tumors have shrunk, which is something that not a lot of people when they are going through the diagnosis of glioblastoma ever hear to begin with. Um, you let some animal products back in, the tumor doesn't shrink. And so did you go back then on the whole food plant-based diet? Uh, I am. And, and from that moment on, I was when I didn't see any movement. So it's in 2018, so many years later, finally, there are no tumors in my head, as far as I know. Um, I haven't gotten mm -hmm. scanned in three years. And so I'm um, very grateful and not surprised either. I'm, uh, I'm, I really am a huge believer of the power of the body wanting to heal itself. The body wants to be well. Mm -hmm. And we just have to remind ourselves how much control we have, I think. Yeah, you hit on such a good point there that what you just said about how much control we actually have. I think that that is so hard for people to to come to terms with. I mean, it, it's understandable. We're brought up, um, you know, to to really rely on doctors and hospitals and they're they're wonderful. They really are. Um, but we do have these amazing bodies that are able to heal themselves. So how do we how do we convince people that they do have that ability? And I'm not saying even that everybody who is diagnosed with cancer, this is the route they need to take. That's a conversation, of course, that they need to have with their doctor and figure out the best plan for themselves. But how do you convince people that that you do have more control than you think you do? I think just asking them, are they willing to experiment with themselves? It doesn't have to be a long experiment. You could do a food experiment for a day, two days, three days. You will notice a change. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, I, I also might want to ask someone to consider getting very, very quiet and seeing what comes up for them because I'm also a believer that we all have the answers within us. And so often, I, myself included, we give our power away to the media, to people that we believe are the experts, and uh, it's extremely empowering and exciting to know that just try to get rid of the chatter that's going on around you and see what your own body says to you. Your body talks to you all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's it's really a difficult thing for a lot of people to you know make that switch to 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 a whole food plant based diet. It's not easy, you know. You were brought up on the same diet that that I was the the standard American diet where we we talked about the the way our plate looked when we were kids. You know, the bigger portion was always the meat. It was the main course, and the vegetables were the side dish, and so flip-flopping that is really, really difficult. Did you struggle with that? Um, probably not as much because you mentioned that you didn't really like meat, but you know, for people who are saying, I, I would like to do this, but I don't know how, and it's really hard. What advice do you have for them? I would say, don't go to a place of deprivation. Like, what should I take out? I would say, what can I add in? So if, mm -hmm. if you're not drinking enough water, add in more water. If you're not filling up your plate with vegetables or enough vegetables um it just add more in one more serving just take it step by step like anything else these habits take time and uh try to throw judgment out the window which is not easy at all and and uh sitting at the table and preparing food and sitting down with people that you care about or even when you're sitting alone you care about yourself and it's 
it can become a very satisfying, kind, loving gesture to feed yourself whole, healthy plants and and uh, just see how it feels and do it one step at a time just to add something in. Add your favorite vegetable in. Go and when you're when you're shopping, try to maybe just see what you feel like eating for that day. Just look around and see what you gravitate naturally to. You'll mm -hmm. see how much freedom you have in in changing some of those habits and you don't have to get rid of anything. Just start yeah. adding something. Yeah, that, that's a great point too because um you know Dr. Campbell talks a lot too about when he's researching this, a lot of times when you see um, higher cancer rates and, and more animal protein in somebody's diet, what that actually means too is that there are, are, is far less of protective plants in someone's diet. So that's a really good thing that you mentioned was if, if it's a struggle at first, maybe don't necessarily focus on what you're giving up. Focus on adding in some of these really great foods that you like. And I really like that. Is that something that you encourage? Uh, you're a health coach. So is that one of your main things that you encourage some of your clients to do? Always, yeah. Coming from a place of deprivation can really do a number on us. It, it's, uh, it can mess with our mind and our thoughts. And that's just the beginning of, of negative feedback for yourself. So it is something I recommend mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. And I have a feeling that you are a pretty amazing example for your clients as well and, and your students that you teach. And I think when we were talking before, you said um, you actually teach the China study occasionally to your students. Uh, what kind of pushback do you get there? I know that that's something that a lot of people in the plant based community struggle with is, um, you know, that pushback, that fear, that I, I can't believe this sort of thing, but you actually lived this. You saw the proof of what it can do with your diagnosis. So how do you deal with that? So dealing with pushback uh, wasn't so easy for me in the beginning. I rarely get any pushback today. Uh, in fact, none from parents in, in a few years, but in the beginning it was pretty tough. I would receive emails or phone calls from parents who became very emotional over me sharing information that was based on science in the classroom. And I would be very careful not to, I wouldn't share anything personal that would happen with me, but I would ask the, the children, you know, just do an experiment. Maybe you can start, choose a night this week where you can prepare a meal for your parents and, and just see what happens, you know, cook what you like and um, just make note of, of the dynamic at your kitchen table. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I did get some, some pushback. I am curious, you know, when you went back to the doctor after that uh, diagnosis and then you changed your diet to a whole food plant-based diet and that second scan where you saw it decrease, um, did you tell the doctor what you've been doing? Did he ask about nutrition? You know, did you tell him like, this is why I think that this tumor shrunk? I did. I did. And he said, just keep doing what you're doing. Amazing. Yeah. Because that's a lot. That's something else I think a lot of people struggle with. Of course, we know that unfortunately in our medical system that most doctors don't receive much of any nutrition training. So that's not something that's brought up. So um, the idea, I think, of treating disease, especially one like yours, uh, such an aggressive form of cancer is not really accepted, but he seemed to have accepted it. He did. Yeah, he did. He did. He wasn't asking me any questions. He did not appear to be surprised. He, uh, mm -hmm. he did accept it. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about too how a lot of people watching, you know, they they look for these success stories. They want to be given hope when they're given this sort of diagnosis. Um, 
what would you say to someone who is sitting in that position that you were in in 2008, leaving the doctor's office, sitting in your car, gathering yourself, wondering what you were going to tell your your child about this? Um, you know, just that really terrifying position that so many people are in right now. If there's anything they can do to alleviate some of the fear, if not you know, get yourself in a position where you can calm your nervous system so fear can go away and then listen to what your body's voice is going to be telling you. Um, and certainly if you're watching this video now, you know the, the benefits of eating a plant-based diet. It's The support is out there. It's, it's all scientifically based. Um, I would say if this is a great opportunity to get to know yourself better and to reclaim power over your life perhaps quite often when we become sick it's a message to take a closer look at how we can better our lives and at least that's what i believe and so illness is a message for us so listen to your body and and see what it says for you. My body told me I didn't have to worry that, that this was not going to kill me. It was it was loud for me. It was loud and clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is great. I mean, and especially because you have so many pillars of, of health already instilled in you um, with, you know, getting enough sleep at night and making sure that your nutrition is on point and things like that. So, um, that those are just things that are so important. And like you said, we shouldn't be waiting until our body is, is telling us you're not doing it right because we're sick. We need to start before that happens. So as a health right. coach, you know, what can you tell people, what can they start doing right now to prevent that from happening, to start healing now before it gets to that point? I would say do something fun. Like, well, to me, something fun would be to just make a, d a meal that you love, that resonates with you, ingredients that gravitate towards, and create a lovely meal for yourself. Mindful eating is a big part of being, being well, and uh, there are all different kinds of components to teaching someone how to change their relationship to food. So one thing I would, would recommend is do an experiment. I think experiments are fun. It can harm you to just try one day without any meat in it or any animal product in it at all and see how you sleep, see how well you feel the next day. Mm -hmm. That would be the first, one of the first things I would recommend. I love that. You can tell that you're from a science background because you keep talking about yeah. experiments, which I, I love. I think that's great. Um, yeah. And I think, I think too, it's so true. When people tell me that they don't like to cook, I'm always like, I think you're doing it wrong because, because cooking can be so much fun. It doesn't have to be stressful, you know, get in the kitchen, um, put on some music and, you know, listen to the sounds and enjoy the smell and, you know, just have fun with it and, and then think about what it's doing for your body, which I think is something that was really important um, from speaking with you and getting to know you a little bit more. I think that played a huge role when you were, you know, nourishing your body and using it as medicine, you were acknowledging that while you were doing it. I was, I was. And in fact, I still do that. Um, you know, I, I will use food as medicine in a way where I, it, I know if I've got like this interview today made me a little bit, you know, like, Oh, I've never done this before. This is my first webcast. So I made sure that I, I just took really good care of myself today. And, and that includes obviously eating um, a healthy meal. Um, pre to it. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. <laughs> no, I think you are. Yeah, it plays so many roles. I did the same thing. It can even be a good, good stress relief as well. But yeah, just, you know, yeah. being able to use that food as medicine and acknowledge what it can do for your body, I think is so important because so many times we're just, you know, running through the drive through because we're busy and, and shoveling food in when we have time to do it. We're not really thinking about, you know, all of the things that when you put 
food in your body. It has so many functions. It's it's doing so many things for us. So you, we, it's really important to be putting the right things in your mouth every day. I agree. You know, plants are here to heal us. That's I think that's the role of uh, the universe here with everything that they have to offer us is is so intelligent. So not just in our mouths, but on our bodies and through our noses. I mean, plants are here to heal us. I'm mm -hmm. period, you know? Yeah, no, I totally agree. Would you? Yeah, I, mean, I don't sorry. even go outside and just take a look at what's around me here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this takes a lot of practice but you can get savvy where you just have to go outside and pick your salad. Even if you don't have a garden, you can pick your weeds to eat for, you know, as, as part of your dinner plan. It's really fun. Yeah. Really, really yeah. fun. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, would you say, you know, through your experimentation with, with your diagnosis and and honestly, I, you know, I hate to think, to think that this ever happened to somebody for a reason, but I think that you are such a great example for people to be able to show them that even the worst diagnosis of cancer, you can come out on the other side. It just depends on how you're going to go into it and, and your plan of action and things like that. So many factors play into it. Um, would you say that a whole food plant-based diet is part of the reason or a huge reason why you're still here today? Huge. Oh, absolutely huge. Yeah. I if if I deviate at all and and not stay aligned with what really benefits me with plants, I feel it. So I absolutely believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Without a doubt. Any other advice? Yeah. I mean, I love it. I think your story is just so powerful, especially, you know, I don't know if you had heard in the news lately, I thought of you whenever I saw this, but there's um, a host of a popular one named Maria Menounos. Um, she does a lot of stuff on E and her mother was diagnosed with glioblastoma um, several years ago, I think about five years ago. And it was a very, very traumatic struggle to watch. You know, she documented it. And so just seeing that difference between your battle with it as opposed to, to what someone else can go through. And I, I don't know the circumstances of, of her treatment and I'm not downplaying anything that they did either, but just to say that this is a terrifying thing to be faced with. Um, so to see someone like you still sitting here, still vibrant, still living life is just such an amazing example of what diet and, you know, just taking care of yourself in general can do. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you saying yeah. that. And having faith that your body wants to be well and practice that. Absolutely. Practice because it's, it sounds foreign. If you're not used to this mindset, it, it will take practice for you to actually believe the lies that you tell yourself. Because I always tell people, start lying mm -hmm. to yourself and say these affirmations, even if you don't believe them. Your your brain chemistry really does listen to your thoughts, I would say, and uh, believe in yourself. Don't give it away. Don't give your power away. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Well, Allison, thank you so much for joining us. Anything else? If if somebody's watching, um, you know, the this, this past two episodes that we're doing, talking all about cancer, really diving into the research and then sharing your success story. So anything else you want to say to people who are facing that right now? I know it can be very frightening. And if you're at all able to calm your nervous system by doing some breath work, you could find a lot of great YouTube videos to help guide you that you, you know, you don't have to do this alone. Other people can teach you what to do. And when you can calm your nervous system and fear goes away for you, that already builds your immune system. So I, I think we can learn to live a freer life where we feel safe all the time and we don't have to live in fear. Fear plays a big part in illness.
Yeah, for sure. Allison, thank you so much again for joining us and sharing your powerful story. We really appreciate it. And thank you to everybody who was listening and watching. We'll see you next time.